Great. Thank Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back again. I see also people now from uh, Nova Scotia and from uh, way up north and uh, east, west, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, Alberta. So again, thank you very much, everybody, for joining and uh, uh, welcome to the uh, live chat conversation exercise that we've been running. Over the last couple of months now, we've been running these live chat exercises. We started off with, and, and I think this diagram here came up timely from Gartner a little while ago, and it talked about uh, disruption. So for the first couple of sessions here, we talked about the crisis, turning crisis into opportunity and what can we do as consultants to help. Then we had a session on collaboration and then about strategy. So now that we're moving into the recovery and a renewal phase of the economy and, and companies are starting to, you know, they've buried the dead and they've moved on, swept the floor and those alive are moving forward and uh, leading into the recovery. A lot of that activity is still very tactical. And one of the topics that came up is, you know, how do you start being strategic in these tactical times and lift yourself out of just making sure that what you're doing now builds something sustainable and scalable going forward. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. The key question that came up here too is what's different with this disruption than any other disruptions we've had before. And I think part of the answer to that is just the magnitude, the speed and the intensity of which everything hit all at once. And, you know, within the matter of about a week and a half or so, the entire planet shut down, which is something that's, you know, probably never happened before that anybody can remember. So it opened up a whole new set of dynamics around, I think, do or die sense of urgency. So this, you know, the, the, um, there's no room left for inertia and dinosaurs and, and, and futzing around with stuff. It's now um, either get it done or get out of the way. And as part of that now, the, the theme here is I think recovering and renewal, what are companies doing? So we're gonna explore different points of view of what companies are doing to adapt their business models, the process and technology opportunities, as well as the key skills that are needed to be able to do that. And to start that off, we're gonna have just a, a dialogue. We'll have uh, uh, three panelists and uh, Eileen, who's gonna help bring us all together. Uh, myself, Bernie, I'll be talking a little bit about supply chain and how the different companies uh, fit together. Then Ron's gonna pick it up from there and talk about what he sees in the financial services space. And then uh, Dwight's gonna bring it all together with what's happening in the uh, organizational effectiveness and the people side of things <coughs> around uh, across all the different uh, groups. Then Eileen's gonna bring us all together um, for a discussion dialogue and she'll be our quarterback to uh, either answer, help us answer questions and direct them through the panel um, or engage people in the audience with, you know, just because you may not have a question, you may have a statement you want to make, that's fine too. Okay, so based on that then, I guess I got to figure out what buttons I need to press. Um, I'll kick it off with the first session. The, um, this panel here, I'm going to talk about supply chains because that's sort of my passion and my area of expertise across a variety of uh, industries. And I'm going to sort of lump them all together as the ecosystem of companies that affect something that we can all see and touch that affects like retail, grocery, food, beverage, consumer packaged goods. Those are all companies that touch the customer and generate demand, which causes manufacturers to build stuff, which causes suppliers to provide manufacturers and then enables transportation providers to do things. So I'm going to take a broad brush at all of that <clears throat> and, and look at what are we seeing in that front? I think the key interesting item I found yesterday was, and this sort of twigged me to this slide, you know, in spite of the fear and the panic, companies are recovering and renewing <clears throat> moving forward. You know, the U.S. Commerce Department yesterday announced $200.8 billion U.S. online business since the start of the pandemic, which is like 21% of all sales. And that's a 44% increase over the same time last year. I mean, that's a monumental fact that commerce is still proceeding in spite of all the obstacles. And it also shows that one of the points I want to make here is that networks of suppliers, not just a chain of supply that can break, but networks tend to become self-healing over time if you do the appropriate pivots. The other comment on the right there is the one from a uh, uh, thing I picked up at a conference is how do you break through barriers in this challenge of crisis? And that's a key message and a theme of what I've seen too is I talk to executives and they say, I don't have time for strategy. Just get on with fix the problem. And I need people who can implement and execute and get stuff done. So, you know, there's a, their example was they spent three years 
working on a digital transformation project. And you know, by the time you oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, and this is hard, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, COVID hit, the executive said, we're gonna be out of business in three weeks and somehow magically got the whole damn thing done in three weeks. <laughs> you know, surprise, surprise. Um, there is investment of taking a whole bunch of things that did fit together and things that have been in place for a while. Walmart, you know, investing three and a half billion dollars in putting together a whole model of what they call omnichannel. And I'll talk about that a little bit because that's kind of the driver for how all of these industries fit together. Is <clears throat> taking all the pieces that they fiddle with for the last several years in different industries, trying to make things work and, you know, better customer experience. And all of a sudden, nobody can come into your store. So you got to find a completely different way of doing things. And if you get into a store, you can't touch anybody. Um, so the entire customer experience has completely changed. And there is, I think, as we move here from uh, uh, into the renewal phase, there's a lot of things happening. And the bottom quote there is, is uh, just a point of view that even the small businesses, now that all the big guys have laid the groundwork and created capabilities, little guys can use them. If you don't have a website, you're doomed. Is an example of a session that we had with one of our members uh, who has a small business running consulting services and IT developments for small businesses. It was a small jewelry store that while everybody else was sitting at home moping, trying to figure out how they're gonna get people to buy their jewelry, set up a website, created a way of creating online appointments, having people do online video, looking at the jewelry and you'll look at my ring. I like that, yeah, I wanna buy it, have it shipped to me on the door, making appointments to do touchless door um, interactions and that sort of thing. So they brought a whole lot of stuff together. So I thought the next step then is, uh, <clears throat> let's talk at it from the customer point of view. And I'm gonna stop sharing the screen here if I remember how to do this. Um, share screen. Uh, advanced sharing options. Actually, how do I stop sharing this thing? Oh, here it is, stop share, press the red button when all else fails. So the couple of things, it starts with a customer and I think looking at the business models here, the first thing that's changed radically is the shift in social distancing, touchless, uh, online bricks and mortars, that discussion has been around for a while. How do you adapt to that if you can't get people into the store? So that whole experience had to be redesigned. And at the front end of the supply chain, if you don't have customers, you don't have things to manufacture. And if you don't have supply, you have nothing to manufacture. So it all rippled down. And companies that have done some things <coughs> that they've done through the renewal or are getting in the renewal process is taking the pieces of things like, how do you ship to your home? How do you ship? Um, picking things up at the store. Then they created in-store shoppers so you can order ahead and have the stuff delivered out to the door and then you pick it up at the curb or have it delivered to your house. So there's a whole bunch of innovation that's occurred by putting together a bunch of things they've been piloting and experimenting with for years. The urgency made it happen. The next thing I've seen too is the capabilities that start at the front end is you know frictionless websites and this whole concept of a uh, an experience. If I go into the store, go to a website, use my mobile device, um, or however I order, I want the experience to be the same. I want to be able to place an order, pay for it, know if it's going to, when it's going to be shipped, have it shipped or picked up. That's sort of the omni-channel experience concept. And pretty much everybody now needs to be able to order, take, and pay. If you're really good and you got money, you can throw in inventory visibility and the ability of the commitments and the shipping, and then preferably you do it for free for shipping and uh, hassle-free returns, because that's what makes it happen. So those are things that have been enabled and consulting people have been helping solve those types of problems. Um, pivoting was the other thing that's really occurred is changing the business model, diversifying your customers and the products that you make. Whoever thought that a beer company would be delivering alcohol to a hospital? And um, whoever thought that an auto company with that put stuff with wheels together would ever be doing visors and, and, and ventilators, again, to hospitals. Or fashion brands that make $1,500 coats could start making masks and gowns and things like that. So a lot of things, you know, you pivot, you change, you try it, you win fast, you lose fast. And some companies, their concept of pivot was, let's change and go into the platform business. So why make it, why build it, why buy it? You know, iTunes, the, 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 the traditional concept is, you know, why do I need to, um, how am I going to sell more CDs if I just have a platform? 
you know, but yet they're making bazillions more than the guys who were selling the CDs ever did. So that bred companies like Amazon Prime, Shopify, and PayPal created new businesses, which in turn, their services are available as a platform to small to mid-sized companies that can do it for a hell of a lot more without the investment. So everybody can play in the thing. The next part too was the execution side of things. Uh, this now gets from retailer down into manufacturing and the suppliers. The single biggest thing I think that's come out of that exercise is the need for the integrated planning and execution and the ability to have visibility of what's in the supply chain. You know, you plan to have something there. If it's not there, it takes me a day to a week to a month to communicate with everybody to find out when is it coming and to get my supply chain going. You have no idea that your supply chain has died and disappeared. So you have no way of, of, of recovering using your systems and processes. So that's what threw everybody a loop. And hence the change in the business model and the execution tools that need and where they need consulting help and systems and processes and AI all to come together to help create that visibility and tracking. Did you know that only 14% to 17% of all of the businesses around connect with each other electronically to do business? Everybody else still uses paper and faxes and Excel spreadsheets and things like that. So, I mean, the opportunity is huge. You know, I was leading supply chain re-engineering at Coca-Cola in Canada in the 80s, and we were talking about, and we were actually doing this stuff. And here we are, and, you know, 30 years later, and there's still not much more penetration than there was then. So the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. Uh, so that's an opportunity. Uh, fulfillment, automation, those are some other things that are happening. <coughs> The, you know, if you ever seen the inside of an Amazon warehouse where, you know, the little bucket goes by and, you know, Bernie's order box comes by and I wanted a book and I wanted one of these and it goes through the warehouse and all these little things, people drop stuff in as it goes by their station and they lump it in. It's great. Now think about that in the grocery store. There's a great video that the UK has from one of their grocery chains that's automated their warehouse. So the, uh, you know, Bernie's little shopping basket goes by these little conveyors and a little robot picks up a tomato. Um, <clears throat> sticks it in and weighs it, make sure I get all the right pieces, put it together, sticks it in a shop, puts it in a truck, sends it to the store and I can pick it at the curb or have it delivered to my house. I mean, those are business models that are now enabled as a function of this. And that links together with what I've also seen in the transportation businesses. You know, no trucks are driving, nobody can get across the board except uh, limited, there's nothing to ship on the trucks anyway, but yet the post office and uh, Amazon, these places can't find drivers and trucks. So all of a sudden you pivot to doing work in those industries and all of a sudden you end up with the Uber, um, the Uber truck and the uh, home delivery guys. So, you know, again, consultants, how do you position the serve? How do you help make the business case? How do you help do that? And then the single biggest uh, massive disruption that I've seen there is this whole concept of wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. And when the supply chain dries up and everything stops, you're screwed. So China is the factory of the world. You know, the question there is always, do I resource onshore, offshore? Where do I do it? Well, to rechange everything can take years to move a billion dollar factory somewhere else and change all your supply lines. So we're kind of stuck with that, but somebody has got to do the analysis to figure out what's the right strategy to move forward. And, mapping out what are all the suppliers, like who submits to whom. We had great visibility of who I buy from, but I couldn't buy from them because they had no supply because their supplier didn't have anything. So it's the Gazinta, Gazinta, Gazinta piece that's the challenge. So mapping is a, is, a, is a huge opportunity for consultants right now to get into to help companies figure out what their supply chain even looks like. Um, and then also go back to the basics of what about alternatives and substitutable parts? If you can't get it from here, can you get it from somewhere else? And having a plan to do that and pre-qualified suppliers. Supply chain 101, I learned that in the 80s. Um, we haven't done that. When have we gotten too lean and how do we dig ourselves out of, um, you know, I optimize on cost, but I can't, um, I can't execute now and I'm screwed which opens up the concept of risk mitigation strategies need a refresh of what do I do if this happens or if that happens and coming up with a plan um, soon enough ahead of time. So those are some of the things that, uh, that I've seen. And I mean, I talked a little bit about the digital transformations and the augmented intelligence or AI cloud computing. Those are all things that need consulting support to do it. So my final point then is on 
the skills and behaviors required. And I think we're at a point where we really need to skill up, um, specifically in just some subject expertise in different areas and in different companies. And the methodologies, breakthrough thinking and change leadership, I think is the most fundamental thing that's lacking is there's a lot of advice and a lot of smart people, but there's a whole gap of getting stuff done, being able to solve problems, being able to overcome the obstacles and drive past that. So that's where I think, you know, concepts like agile design thinking and um, uh, blue ocean concepts as a, for instance, how do you create a new business? Things I, I know how to do well, but nobody cares. So how do I pivot to a different business and sell it to somebody else where there isn't any competition, but needs my expertise that they couldn't get or afford anywhere else. So reinventing your businesses sometimes, the top of the mountain concept of how to overcome obstacles that really aren't there. You wanna know how to get to the other side of a mountain, ask Eileen, she'll give you a, a lesson, um, et cetera. And I think just the whole concept of change leadership, building strong teams and getting stuff done is, is, is what they're looking for. Not just advice and sheer brilliance, but actionable things that will help move the ball forward very quickly. So that's what I've seen in the manufacturing and supply chain industry. And it's generic. It fits everywhere. So I try to sort of net it out into one big shell. Okay. So with that, I'll pass it on to, um, to Ron for his perspective on the financials. Ron, you're on mute. You're still on mute there. Well, Ron is unmuting. I will just uh, step in and say thank you. Um, we have Francois and Milos and Ian who have actually made some comments. I want to engage you in an interactive dialogue, you know, at the end of this. So we're going to hear from Ron. We're going to hear from Dwight. And, and I do want to keep the conversation going. On to you, Ron. I was just Am I successfully say. unmuted myself? Yeah. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Tell me when you want your slide. The people who know me well will be amused that I could be stuck on mute. Um, so financial institutions. Um, before I dive into financial institutions, I, I think Bernie kind of walked across a really nice cross-industry view, and I particularly like taking over from Bernie at a point where he said, so the last thing anybody wants is a strategy. They just want to get something done when I come up to talk about strategy. So it's, thanks Bernie, great setup. I'm really happy with that. <laughs> um, I think the question that, um, the question about FIs needs a moment's context first though. Industries have been walloped in disproportionate ways. And I think that's worth reflecting on for a moment. Um, if you were an airline, your revenue has gone to zero. If you were a restaurant for a little while, your revenue went to zero and it might be coming back if you found a way to do takeout or if you found a way to do patios or if you're in stage three somewhere or something like that. If you were a hotel, you might be discovering people are starting to travel a little bit more. If you were in oil and gas, your industry got walloped because people stopped driving and people stopped flying and people stopped needing stuff that required gas on the scale that they wanted to produce. If you're in commercial real estate, the other shoe hasn't dropped yet because people are going to be figuring out maybe they don't need exactly the same footprint they needed. So the FI conversation, financial institutions, is going to be specific a little bit to financial institutions, but the, the messages are really harmonized. And I think the slide I'd like to put up, <clears throat> I can't actually see the screen that's up, but Bernie, I'm going to let you do that. Um, the screen that is Bernie's slide again from Gartner, because I think it's um, really speaks to the three phases of respond, recover, and renew. And when we look at it from the FI perspective, um, the FI space to start with is, is actually, well, you might think of the big banks as the big banks and the big insurers as the big insurers and what's new in FI. Um, it's actually a hyper competitive space in a whole lot of ways. Google and Apple have found a way to inveigle themselves into the payment processing collection, revenue collection. We've got new banks like Simply and Triangle who are offering credit cards and a whole bunch of things. One of the larger credit unions in the country has just turned itself inside out and made itself the owner of a bank that's gonna offer services nationally and online. So there's no shortage of competitive desire in the market space 
And if you're a large bank, you're desperately trying to re-engineer your, you were desperately trying to re-engineer yourself to be ever better in that way. And suddenly this hits. For the banks, they didn't lose for the banks, for the insurance companies, for most of the people in the FI space. They didn't actually have a revenue hit. The response phase was different because they became, in some cases, the connection between customers and governments. They created loan programs. They created extraordinary programs. And they were the linchpin to financial security. So they had the resources. They had the customers. They had a capability set that everybody needed to exploit. And so they're not going to go through recover quite the same way. They're going to skip over that. During the first six weeks, when we were trying to reach out to all of the people we would want to talk to in the normal course of events, from CEOs to, you know, directors of architecture, all the way up and down that list, from, you know, everywhere from the big banks to small insurers, nobody would return our call. First six weeks. But suddenly now everybody's returning the calls because everybody's trying to figure out how they exit stronger. So we can actually see in the financial institution space that really there's a tremendous kind of, they've gotten over the first big hump of respond and they're into the what's next phase. And they're fussed on exiting stronger in a couple of really significant ways. And they're actually trying to do some planning, some real thinking about data, digital transformation, customer experience, and trying to think through how they become ever more entrenched through this model. And I think we can probably exit because I exit the slide burning because I think the slide's gonna take away from what I wanna share next. Um, but I think that when, I turn, when we turn our minds to this conversation, mostly what we see is that they're doing this work. They're thinking about exiting stronger in three key pillars. Pillar number one, customers and core services. Clearly, they've got new loans out, new programs. They've, been, they've become the implementer for some things. Insurance companies have offered rebates, and they're trying to make sure they stay on everybody's good side. Regulators are watching over them. They're relaxing some. Stand. They're focused very much on that whole customer experience. And they're focused very much on understanding what they can do to help customers without doing maybe anything more than they absolutely need to do or that government's prepared to backstop perhaps in some cases, but they're very fussed about some of that. So pillar number one, focus on customer and core services. Pillar number two, anybody who's worked in the FIs knows that there's a tremendously capable internal function around a set of management functions like risk management, regulatory, cash <clears throat> cash management, um, a whole bunch of internal things. Everybody's working really hard to strengthen them and they reflect some of the kinds of uh, comments that I think Bernie was making earlier. There's a just get it done attitude in some of these environments where what it costs is actually secondary. If you're gonna take a hit financially, this is as good a quarter as any to take it. And that might be two or three quarters worth of this is as good a quarter as any to take it. But if you're gonna build something, get it done fast, get it done good, and let's move on quickly because we need to move it. And that applies to data, it applies to BI, it applies to the regulatory alignment, it applies to, if you think for one minute, as they renew mortgages to people who are out of work, that they are one little bit less aware for a moment of which mortgages might be suspect, um, not, not in the least less aware. They just, they have to get it done anyways. And so they're alert, they're conscious, they're kind of working through that, but that's in the internal operations pillar, not stuff that they necessarily share. The third pillar is, um, is really kind of interesting in terms of a lot of the conversations we're having, and it's about connectivity and connections. And we're seeing credentialing as really a new big question that people are starting to really turn their minds to, because I think there are suddenly models out there. If anybody's used the bank to authenticate recently at CRA, that's one of the better ways to authenticate it, turns out. 
and it relies on the bank to be at the centerpiece of credentialing and authentication. And there's a whole technology infrastructure around knowing for sure who's who when you register for a new service, which is one of the things that, by the way, empowered CRA to be able to deliver some of these stuff so quickly. They had a good idea that people were exactly who they said, they, at least until last weekend, by the way, which raises the next question about cybersecurity. Um, so I think there's a whole lot of questions on the connectivity and connections question, which is that third pillar. But I, I would say on the connectivity and connections piece, and Bernie alluded to this also, there's a sudden readiness to exploit those capabilities because they've already hit scale. We have the technological capability today to work from home, partly because everybody's been watching Netflix at night for the last five years and bandwidth has been improving. So the capability has been built out in something less than a crisis. And the capability is suddenly ready to exploit. And that's true of credentialing. That's true in some of the cyber areas. There's a whole number of parts that have kind of in a place. And the people who have that infrastructure and platform to exploit, like banks, like insurance companies, are trying to figure out exactly how they can exploit it going on. So when I say they're all looking to say exit smarter and to get ahead, they're actually fussed on these three pillars for the most part customers, internal operations, and then sort of the whole connectivity, connection, and a whole lot of parts underneath that. So I could talk a lot more about some of these things, and maybe we'll come at it through the questions, but I'm uh, cautious of time, and I don't want to run too far over. So we'll let it go, and I will hand it over to Dwight, and Dwight, you can take uh, the next kick at this. Thank you very much, uh, Bernie and Ron. I really appreciate that. Those are, uh, those are excellent points. I'm going to be coming at it from a slightly different direction because we'll be talking about uh, general uh, organizational performance and uh, what's happened, uh, what's caused the, the issues and uh, how organizations really need to be thinking uh, when, as they prepare for renewal and prepare for whatever that next uh, major disruption uh, might be. If, if you think uh, in normal times, pre-COVID times, uh, most of the last decade, for, for example, um, when things are in that normal mode, uh, most organizations are successful. If you think about organizations that aren't successful, they don't hang around very long. They, uh, they end up uh, either in bankruptcy or, or changing the business model. Um, but even as they are successful, most organizations and as management consultants, I, I know you've all seen this when you go inside an organization, there are a lot of irritants. Uh, they, they show themselves up in things like the owner saying, um, you know, who is accountable for that? And, and, and the owner means who, who did something they shouldn't have or, or who didn't something, uh, who didn't do something that they should have or, or who missed making a decision. In other words, something happened in the organization that, uh, that they weren't happy with. Uh, there's issues with workflow. 50% um, of managers in our research and, and client work uh, say that they, they, they don't believe that work flows smoothly across their organization. There's silos which lead to role conflict. Uh, there's uh, too many meetings. There's all kinds of issues that get in the way uh, of being a top performing organization and yet organizations are able to are able to absorb that and put up with that. And the reason they put up with that is that they're primarily focused on the output measures in their organization. They're mostly concerned about things like uh, the sales levels, uh, production levels, the quality of production, return rates, uh, revenue levels, uh, which all at the end of the day comes down to uh, what are our margins and, and what are our profits. And there's a lot of sophistication in organizations at, at measuring those kinds of things. And as long as that's going all right, there's, less, and there's not as much attention going into what I call these, these irritants inside the organization that detract from the organization being as successful as, as it could be. So when it comes to a time of disruption though, such as we had with COVID, and I agree with uh, both of you, this is uh, sort of a, an amazing uh, major disruption. It's never happened before where everyone is disrupted in, in the same way at the same time. Uh, but whether it's happening because of a global pandemic or whether it's be hap happening Uber style because of technological improvements or because somebody's come up with a better business model in your industry, think how the phone has revolutionized GPS and uh, cameras and film industries. 
um, whatever those kinds of things impact upon you in your organization, you can no longer afford to have these kinds of irritants in the organization because they create churn, they burn up energy that's uh, not used in a productive way, and they lead to people focusing in on things that they should not be focusing in on and, and not being focused on the, on the strategy and, and, and the things that they need to, uh, to be able to improve successfully. So, so as organizations prepare now, they've gotten through the first two phases. I love, I love that Gartner chart. They're now looking at the renewal or the reset stage. What they have to start thinking about is how do we change ourselves? How do we organize ourselves in a way that's more efficient so that we can take advantage of the bounce back whenever that happens? And so that we can be better prepared uh, for other types of disruption that might be coming down the road uh, and not knowing how long the pandemic will last, when that will renew, what will happen to customer service and so on. So to help, uh, to help our clients with that, we've developed a, um, a model that I would like to, uh, like to share with you. And what we've done in that model is we compare uh, an organization to a tree because tree is a very complex organism. An organization is a very complex uh, uh, complex um, system as well. And in terms of the tree, we, we, we try to think of it in three components and make those, uh, those linkages to the, um, uh, to the organization so we can differentiate between those output measures and those input measures that are so important in getting rid of those irritants that exist in, in organizations. So if we, if we put the model up on the screen, it has three main components. The first component are those structural elements. So what is the structure of an organization? Uh, if you think in terms of the tree, it's the bedrock. A tree needs something stable to, uh, to be able to exist upon. Similarly, an organization needs its business model. That's the most fundamental starting point. Who are our customers? What is our product or service? And then we need to have a strategy, which is like the topsoil for the tree. We need the strategy in terms of how do we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace? How do we ensure that our business model can be implemented in the most successful way possible? And then the third element of the structure is the organization design. And I like to think of that as the root structure of, of the tree, which, which uh, creates the life uh, blood of the tree by, by getting the nutrients from the soil. In the same way, an organization will align itself to its business model and structure so it can operate in the, in the environment in, in the most successful way possible. So that's, uh, that's the, the structural parts of an organization. What is our business model, our strategy? Most organizations are pretty good at doing that. Organization design, the jury's out in most organizations about whether that's right or not, uh, but at least most of them are aware of that. If we go to the top part of the tree, uh, this is where we start talking about the outcomes. Uh, I like to think about culture as an outcome because culture is the result of how people work together and uh, relate with each other inside the organization. And that depends on, I'll be telling you in a few moments about some of these input measures. So the culture really defines in the same way the branches of a tree define what the tree looks like. The culture defines how it is that we collaborate and work together inside the organization. And success in that will drive performance of the organization. Performance being like the foliage of the tree. If you've got gr bright green foliage for a green tree, then it's healthy and, and strong. Similarly, the balance sheet is in the black and, and strong and, and the P&L. And then finally, the fruit of the tree is equivalent to the profit. So if everything's working well, then, then you get the profit that you're expecting. If it's a not-for-profit organization, of course, then it's measured uh, more in, in output of, uh, of uh, services uh, than it would be in actual monetary funds. So what's, what's left then? What's left is, is this middle part, the trunk of the tree that connects, connects the structure to the outputs. And there we have, uh, we have three different things and it's all having to do with the people in the organization. So what in terms of people and people working, having all of those inputs aligned properly so that the people are, your people in the organization are, are implementing your strategy in, consist, in a consistent way, uh, you need to have three things in place. The, the first one is an accountability and authority model. This is a language for how we work together inside the organization. How do we delegate work in the organization as managers? How do we ensure that people are collaborating well throughout the organization? Uh, the second part is managerial leadership. Are we sure that managers are doing their managerial leadership work? And that's got two components. It's got the management part, 
and everybody from the owner to the executive to the directors have some piece of management that they have to do. Many in the higher level say they're leaders and they don't need to do that, but yes, they do. They need to manage as well. And then there's the leadership component that every role who's accountable for a team must have. The two together are the managerial leadership work, and we need to ensure that, that that's happening in the right way. Otherwise, the churn that I was talking about gets really crazy. And then the third component is the managerial capability. This is the fit to role part of it. How do we get people into roles to be sure that they are capable of doing what is necessary uh, to, uh, to carry out the functions that they're accountable for and, and to uh, produce the deliverables that they're accountable for. So in, it's all about then structure, people doing what people need to do inside the organization and the owner being sure that they have the right system in place to do that. Uh, which will which will develop the, the outcomes. So measuring that and, and supporting that in the right way becomes import, uh, important and that effective managers, our main, our main goal is working with heads of organizations to help them assess and give them pictures of what's happening in the organization on the input side so that they're able to really understand what's happening inside my organization so that when it comes time to pivot, when it comes time to be resilient, we have all the right people in the right roles doing the right things uh, and um, have a common language for how we work together so that we can pivot quickly, so that we can take advantage of opportunities, and uh, so that when the next hit comes, uh, we're ready to respond in the best way. So uh, that's, that's taken my time. Uh, again, uh, as uh, you said, Ron, we could <laughs> talk about this for ages, uh, but uh, I wanted to give you that concept and that model and share that with you and happy to answer any questions. So over to you, Eileen. Thanks so much, Dwight and Bernie and Ron for all of the insight that you've shared. And thank you to everyone who's watching today who has been contributing in the chat room. We now have 20 minutes where I really want to tap into the brain power of this group. As an organization, certified management consultants represent, you know, some world-class minds across the country. I believe everyone in the call still here is from Canada, but we are across the country. Um, so there are 84 people on the call right now, which puts us in between four different panels. If you want to engage with us, I invite you to put your video on. That should pop you onto the front page and I'll be able to see you a little bit better. Um, I'm going to try to juggle the questions that were written with also extending invitations to come off of mute and engage in interactive dialogue so that we can hopefully hit all of them in the next 20 minutes. Um, I noticed Francois had the first observation, well, it was more just a desire to hear thoughts on the challenges of change management in a period of uncertainty. Um, you know, as to where you should be changing to and landing on. Francois, do you want to come off mute and maybe just clarify what else you'd like to hear? And if uh, Dwight, Bernie, Ron, or anyone else on the call wants to talk about that. Francois, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, thank Beautiful. you for, uh, for, for um, uh, picking my, 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 my thoughts. I think that the challenge is we're like, as it's essentially it's a rolling target. Like, you know, like we're able to do this, we're able to do that. And then who knows how long that, that, that the current target or, 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 or space that we're able to work in. I was thinking more of, of businesses that it's harder to actually achieve the, um, the proper margins as you try to move to, for example, delivery. Um, like it's cutting in in, in, your, in, your, in your sales. So I'm in an office environment. Office environment, you know, arguably would be easier to 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 transform or, or have a maybe more opportunity. But the minute you, you involve a lot of, of um, human resource and employees, then your margins are really thin. And then you're looking at the environment now, which is in, in, depending on the province uh, and the city, like you can have like, like half the, the space is actually generating revenue. You can pivot to an online uh, delivery system, but then you're losing like 30% of your, your margin. And I, I'm just trying to think like how as a business, and, and I'm thinking it as a more the immediate, they still need to survive and thrive. Um, so anyway, just looking for, for different thoughts. I really appreciate the forum, by the way, as far as like getting different, different uh, um, um, on, on the industry and, and the, the challenges at hand. These are like significant challenges. Thanks so much. Thank you, Francois. Bernie, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I figure somebody would be phoning me right at this moment. I don't want to turn oh. the phone off. <laughs> um, yeah, I think part of the, um, the work from home and, and, and some of those things, it's, it's a destination. It's like change management. Um, there's, uh, what are the outcomes and the goals that you're looking for? And if you've got those singular goals, you can get things to rally around and people to work through. 
then you can start looking at what are the obstacles to that outcome. If the outcome is I need more engagement or I need to increase my profit margin, what are the obstacles to me getting there? So I think part of it is uh, from a consulting perspective, what is a methodology that you can use to guide yourself through the alternatives and the approaches to solving the problem? It comes down to, I think the big challenge is how do we better solve problems and how do we get to an answer quickly? And what are the techniques, if we don't have an answer, what are the techniques to quantify what the end result needs to be? What are the obstacles in the way? What are the ways we can blow those obstacles away and be very aggressive about it and be able to uh, uh, get an appropriate conclusion? And if it's wrong, start over again. So you've got the agile approaches, mm -hmm. try something and uh, do the sales approaches, win fast, lose fast, try again, repeat, rinse and repeat. Thanks, Bernie. Um, Milos made an observation who had to pop off the call, but he mentioned that it took Canadian companies three months to transform to making masks and putting them on shelves, whereas in Europe, it took some companies no more than a month. So just something to ponder is like, why did we advance slower than, than Europeans? Um, Ian, you brought up, and I see your beautiful boardroom table there, Ian, beautiful, and then you just magically just popped up. Feel free to take yourself off mute uh, in terms of speaking to the public sector and municipal government cycles. Right, and actually it, it, uh, it translates very well to something that Bernie just talked about around uh, agility, and that most of what I've heard the conversation uh, around is, is private sector where there is the ability to make decisions perhaps without checking quite so much higher up or looking at the political considerations. But uh, working in government, particularly in local government, which uh, doesn't have a huge um, structure behind it in a lot of cases, I find that uh, acknowledging the risk and innovation are kind of two sides of the same, same coin. They're really risk adverse and therefore they, tend, they end up being innovation adverse. And they also then end up being behind, uh, kind of behind the curve if we were to refer to that uh, Gartner chart again. I, so I, if any of you have any ideas about how to convince uh, public officials, whether it's senior public officials or elected officials, about how to shorten those cycles, I'd really be interested in that. And if there's anyone else on the call who is in the private sector who wants to come off mute and, and share their thoughts. And if not, you know, Dwight, Bernie, Ron, do you have any thoughts on this? I've always been private, private, and more private. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really welcome insights from others. So am I off mute here? You are, Ron. Yeah. Um, so the public sector, especially provincial and municipal, I have to say, that's a tough space to try to get them to accelerate. So I, I get the real point because I think that there's a, um, that's uh, the training, the education, the way we promote people, the way we educate people, it's all about tamping down the risk. It's not about being innovative and taking a chance. And so when you stop and you kind of think about how do you have to really deal with that, on the other hand, there's a significant difference community to community in the response and what people are doing. So one of the things that we're seeing with the, the financial institutions and some of the other um, large enterprises is the bigger you are, the more inclined you are to try to figure out how to take risks. And so I think that if you're looking for places where there are likely to be more receptivity to innovative ideas. It's probably places with a little bit more maneuvering room. And I think that's probably terrible news if you are, if your beat is necessarily places with, you know, small in particular municipal governments. So I think that there's uh, this kind of, you know, it's, it's, but it's a bit of understanding the, the tempo of the marketplace at that point. So to my mind, I think that the bigger you are, the more inclined people are to tolerate uh, risk taking. The smaller you are, um, the less tolerant. And I think that maybe there's there's an opportunity um, to think about that in, gra in graduating uh, how you deal with certain different kinds of customers and how you pursue different sales cycles. I'll throw culture into that as well. That some places will have a culture that does tolerate uh, risk. Others don't. Um, a lot of places will look inwards for best practice rather than looking outside for best practice. So. I'm glad to hear that that's, there is no magic bullet and I just haven't missed it. 
And that actually ties nicely into Carol's question, which is what are people seeing in terms of employee experience um, impacts to workplace culture during these disruptive times? Carol, if you have anything to add to that, please come off mute and join us. Um, and Dwight, you might perhaps have some insights onto this culture piece if you had anything that you wanted to share. It, um, th that is a real challenge because um, as, as Bernie was mentioning, this change in terms of work from home and different ways of, of aligning our workforces happened at lightning speed compared to how organizations usually move. So managers were scrambling to, uh, to manage their teams remotely and even being remote themselves. So it really is a situational management kind of an approach. And what managers need to do is double down on the communication side and really double down on the clarity of delegation side in terms of setting context to help people understand what's expected, what can, you know, what's reasonable, how do we, how do we work together in this new situation. The situational part of it is, is that your team members will react differently because some of them, uh, the introverted types are thinking this is the best thing since sliced bread. I get to hunker down and just do my work and nobody's bothering me. Uh, the extroverts on the team are pulling their hair out and saying, I'm going to go crazy if I can't have a cup of coffee with someone soon. So the manager has to recognize that and really draw people in. The last point I'd make on it is, uh, is measurement systems because become even more important, but not in the draconian sense of measuring output, in the sense of having your finger on the pulse of where your people are at. So, so figuring out different ways of communicating with them, perhaps pulse surveys a little bit more often just to get objective feedback in terms of how people are feeling so that you can be giving them the kind of support and guidance that they need. But I think bottom line, the work from home movement over the last few months is, is, is a godsend. It's going to improve productivity, but managers need to uh, work harder at ensuring that they're keeping their teams motivated and uh, involved in, in the way that they need to be. Mm -hmm. Tim Kiss made a comment, the potential loss of company culture because people are not physically together is an issue gaining traction. Tim, did you want to expand on that any further? And Carol, yeah, I got sure. your note saying that you couldn't join us live, but Carol, I hope that this conversation is helping you, you with uh, this discussion. Hi, Carol, I can see you there now with the uh, discussion around um, culture. Tim, anything to add? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eileen. Um, I sat in on a webinar uh, about a month ago and the COO of Steelcase Furniture was on and they had done some studies around the world and found that as companies were starting to bring people back into the office, most of them were at about that 10% level. And you could, you could lean on the previous culture that you had built, the culture balance sheet, if you will. But if you didn't quickly get up to about 25% of your staff getting together to start to integrate and get back to some of that stuff, there was a real concern that people will start to dissipate. Yes, you know, there are elements of efficiency and things that can happen when you're working from a home office because you're essentially much more available 24-7. Um, but there's, there's the, the psychological impact that's really starting to uh, become a little bit more well-known these days too with people starting to uh, have depression and, and other feelings that this is something that is, uh, from a psychological perspective, being studied a little bit more too. So the combination of these aspects is, and I think it kind of builds off of what, what Dwight said, not draconian measures of it, but it's much more literally, how are you doing? Exactly. I want to see how you're doing. I need to hear you and I need to be very cognizant as a manager or a leader. I'm looking for body language, et cetera. Anything that can be an indicator that something is amiss or something's off, and then you need to get professional help for people in cases like that. Nice elaboration, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks Tim. Um, I see Francois made another comment, but I want to actually, we have nine minutes left to get through a whole lot of uh, robust conversation. And I'm loving the interactivity and engagement that everybody is, is participating in here. Thank you so much for that. Um, David Smith mentioned, will FI regulators be tempted or encouraged by government to lighten up on various regulatory compliance requirements, such as capital liquidity, et cetera. Um, Ron, do you want to just have any thoughts on that? Or, or David, did you want to expand on that? Or, and, and if there's nothing to expand on, like we don't have to, because there's lots of other questions here. We're good? You're both on mute, so. Actually, uh, ha having worked in the financial industry and worked with OSFI and a number of other regulators over the years, um, there, there are all kinds of different perspectives that are taken and it's very much circumstantial uh, as they work through policies. 
So I'm just curious what the uh, what the reigning environment is is going to be like. What's what's going to happen to the FIs? So am I off mute here? Have I got that nailed you again? Are. I seem to have mute issues today. Just stay off mute, Ron. Stay off. Just mute. Stay off mute. Um, my dog is barking. Oh. <laughs> the the FI posture is um, conflicted between long-term goals and short-term necessity. I think the FIs are recognizing, uh, sorry, the regulators are recognizing that they can't be rigorous today, but they're not prepared completely to take their foot off the gas <clears throat> in terms of regulatory, regulatory robustness uh, of Canadian firms. So, you know, a really interesting example is, um, insurance companies, which probably were otherwise unaffected by premium through to the end of March, um, when you looked at their first quarter results, almost uniformly had terrible first quarter results because the market crashed and they have a big whack of cash in, in investments. So when the investments got marked to market at the end of the first quarter, they all had terrible losses that you want to say were paper losses, rationally. But after years of saying, those aren't paper losses, those are real losses, and you need to figure out how to compensate yourself for, or how to deal with pension shortfalls and capital adequacy short. And after years of doing that, they kind of had to do a double take on a lot of these issues. So the regulatory posture I would describe as conflicted, but not taking their eye off the ball. So they're aware of kind of what the issues look like. They're aware of what the, the posture is. Um, they are aware that it's better to have a functioning economy than a theoretically solidly managed economy that's not functioning. Having said that, they're all very nervous. So I think that's kind of the, the posture, and I think there's, uh, there's a lot of scrutiny and discussion in those quarters. Thanks, Ron. <clears throat> Gail, I noticed that you had asked a question about wanting some insights on how we can help our clients help their employees with the longer term implications of work from here, work from home. Uh, and then I subsequently noticed that you and David had some exchanges and we did have a bit of a conversation around culture. Um, have you felt that's been addressed or do you want to dig a little deeper? No, I'm fine. It's good that others are thinking the same. And Nick, I saw your comment as well. Um, I think it's something we really need to make sure we keep our fingers on and watch that because uh, this is long term. As you pointed out in the original slide, it's that, you know, the actual um, panic, if I can put it that way, um, has happened. You know, everybody went to their home offices, worked, worked from home. Um, this is now going to be a regular way of doing things. So we now need to shift our energy and our focus to how are we going to sustain this, ensure that there is that resilience on a go forward basis. And it's different from dealing with the first emergency. Uh -huh. Can I button in one comment there? Cause I think yeah. there's something really important tucked away in here. Yeah. I think that there's, I was having this exact conversation with a client this morning about what's coming in September and October. Mm -hmm. And there is a tremendous desire to assume that the path that we're on, which is normalizing the virus, will continue to be the path that we're on. And I would caution that while we all want that to be true, mm -hmm. and we all would work very hard to make that true, we should be prepared for repeated spikes in the grief and the chaos along the way that will help to bring increased resilience now that we know what some of those spikes could look like. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, just that's the last thought. I think that there's, we're not out of the woods yet. We mm -hmm. want to believe we're out of the woods. We want it to go on the trajectory that we are on. And we're happy that we're on this trajectory in Canada. But I would leave that one thought kind of tucked away in there as a cautionary flag. Yeah, and so Thank you. did someone else want to say something? If, if I might add, we've been David? working with leaders, including some global firms, uh, for six months now that have moved their teams home. And, and, and many of them have been told they're going to be home for a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The big challenge is going to be, in our observation, working with lots of organizations, is 
optimizing the technology. People are still using Zoom as a conference call with pictures when there is a lot of functionality, mm -hmm. but also accepting the leadership style changes that are necessary in leading teams. People want to be able to inspect what's being done. They cannot do that anymore. They need to manage to outcomes, not process, not activity, right. leadership. Yeah. Great. Point. Important distinction. Um, similar scene, but different direction. Um, and Thomas, is that you putting your hand up? Yes. Or? Yes. yes, it is. Okay. Go ahead, Thomas. I think we have to be careful about uh, self-fulfilling prophecies in the sense that we hear a lot of hue and cry about psychological issues, working from home, etc. And I accept that as a fact in certain people. But in many cases, for example, I've worked from home uh, for plus of 10, 10 years. And that doesn't mean I'm isolated in a, in a hole and don't see anybody. You're out seeing anybody that you can, and but you're interacting constantly. And often, I find, particularly as a consultant, that if you are in the area of the of the client and you're there too long sometimes you become part of the problem instead of part of the solution and so it's i find i find we just have to be a little bit cautious about being concerned about everybody going into a black hole because they're working from a distance and in fact distance distance operations is is not uncommon and it has been for a long time so I, I just, I think we need to think about it just a little more, um, a little more in depth. Thanks, Thomas. And certainly we have the technology to deal with. Um, so I want to segue really briefly into one other thing and then I'm realizing that we're going to have to wrap up. Um, but Fernando, you may or may not be having issues with your mic and technology, but you did mention um, having a number of clients having HR issues um, during the lockdown. Many employees were at home for at least several months. Uh, CERB and EI providing for their needs, but now they're struggling with getting workers back to work and keeping them. More particular manufacturing where staff could not work from home. The mindset of certain employees is causing substantial issues and problems currently. And I have to say that many of my clients have had to just lay off people. Like they have had to, there's this whole other side of the working from home is one issue, but then there's this whole issue of not working, of not being able to keep your operations at the levels that they were and laying people off and dealing with the, the ramifications of that. Um, can anyone here speak to their experiences with that? And Fernando, are you able to join in this part of the conversation? No, okay. Um, so it's Mary Dunlop speaking. I have done a lot of work in this area. So I've been dealing with uh, clients who have laid off employees and needed them to come back in order to bring back their levels of work. And so legally there are ways to do that. Um, and so we've been doing one-on-one -on -one conversations with employees. Um, so the approach that generally I've taken particularly with one of my retailers is where we have an employee who um, has concerns about coming back and just to preface it, uh, they've done a tremendous job of putting a number of layered pieces in place to provide the safety and, and protect the health of the employees. So what we do is when they have those concerns, we immediately have them talk to our health and safety team to make sure that they can ask all the questions they need. We've been very transparent and communicated quite a bit around the involvement of the health and safety committee through all the business decisions to open and close and what sections of the store open and close uh, through the whole process. But we've also, um, you know, taken the time to understand what our legal rights are and what the employees legal rights are and to try and collaboratively come to um, an ability to bring people back where they're comfortable and we're able to maintain our levels and, and where you know, we've had a few situations where we've not been able to, um, you know, then we've had the discussions around parting ways. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. And I noticed that you also mentioned some employers are hiring their ex-employees as a consultant, which is another way to go. I wish we had time to keep this going because this has been amazing, but unfortunately we need to wrap. So I'm gonna pass the torch back over to Bernie and he will wrap this up. <clears throat> 
Great. Thank you very much, everybody. I think it's uh, been a great session. I've seen some good comments coming back from here as well. I think some of my takeaways from this exercise here is that we clearly need a new way of thinking. We need to make sure that the same old paradigms don't apply. This is a period of problem solving. And I think that's the new norm is every challenge, every disruption is going to have a new set of dimensions and we've got to figure out what's the outcome we need. And we really need to get better at leading companies to identify the obstacles, break through the blockers and move on with it. Not just sit there and go, woe is me, there's a big wall. You know, some people blast through it, some people tunnel underneath it, some people just sit there and go hum de ha. And I think that's the outcome based. What is the outcome we need? And what's the compelling business problem? I mean, Cotter wrote about all this stuff. And I think governments and, and, and inertia, you know, I, I keep thinking of Can, Canadians tend to be thought leaders and implementation laggards. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we need to get past that sense of pride amongst ourselves. So our real job now is aligning the capabilities with the business and the operational models to get more strategic again. We need to get better at solving problems and helping companies execute and innovate. And I think that's the role of consultants and certainly the opportunities we have um, to move forward. So um, I think you see the, the name there. Thank you very much, Eileen and Dwight and Ron for uh, supporting and putting all the time into helping prepare for this. And thank you very much to the audience for uh, participating again. And this is the fourth of our session. The next sessions, uh, we are planning another one. I think Alberta is having a session in September on cybersecurity and we have our annual conference, uh, or annual, I guess, our, our national conference coming up that Ontario is producing and hosting. And uh, it'll be on the September or October 27, 28 and 29th. It's three half days. And I think if um, uh, Craig uh, is still on, our president our, from the Ontario chapter, if he's still on, did you want to say a few, uh, a few words on that? I will say fantastic presentation, some great comments from people across the country. And um, I was a little late because I had to go out for a bike ride and clear my brain and take care of my physical side as well as my mental side. Um, and you guys have really helped my uh, intellectual side. So thank you all. And don't forget October. We've got a big conference coming up. Good. Well, thank you very much then. We're closed for today and uh, hope to meet you all virtually, the new reality for a while. Thank you. <laughs>